At the time of the formation of the first Fianna Fáil government in 1932, Padre O'Donnell would attempt to push the IRA to the left. He attempted to do this at the 1933 Army Convention and failing, he would try his hand again the following year. The IRA had been actively involved in social agitation in the 1920s, but by this point in the 30s, its involvement in such activities was waning. There were two great factors for this. One was the church and the anti-communist feeling it was creating in the people, but secondly, the IRA's unusual relationship with Fianna Fáil. Although it may seem strange to us today, in the early 1930s there was a relatively close relationship between sections of the IRA and the Fianna Fáil party. It should be remembered that among the people who set up Fianna Fáil was Countess Markovic, a revolutionary republican and indeed a socialist. While the party had renounced political violence by the 1930s, they were still seen as kindred spirits by many in the IRA. However, the members of the IRA who would go on to involve themselves in the Republican Congress took a very different view. They saw Fianna Fáil as representing the small business owning classes in Ireland, the petty bourgeoisie if you will, and believed they could never be a part of a movement that would bring about a socialist republic. And the IRA's view, and the mainstream of the IRA, whether it was Moss Toomey or Sean McBride, was that they didn't want to become part of this Fianna Fáil project. They didn't want to be submerged into De Valera's new state building enterprise of what was to become Fianna Fáil. And yet they didn't want to separate themselves from it completely either. Uh, they didn't want to set themselves up in opposition to Fianna Fáil. So they saw themselves as the guarantor of the Republic, uh, that they would be this almost external pressure point with one foot in and one foot out to try and push uh, this new Fianna Fáil organisation into what they saw as a more Republican position uh, on whatever the issues uh, of the time were. But the idea, I think, for me, that de Valera was a Republican himself, I, I just don't, I can't buy into that. I can't see any evidence in his life from when he first came into public life to the day he died where he displayed a real grow for Republican values and, and, and believed them and, and tried to implement them and, and put them to the side. None on any... But that was uh, Padre O'Donnell's line was that uh, he didn't have a problem with de Valera not being a socialist because he never claimed he was, mm. but he had a problem with him saying he was a yeah. Republican because he absolutely yeah. wasn't. Yeah. Which is... Yeah. I mean, he was my father's, my grandfather's commanding officer in Baldwin's Mills, the only garrison that didn't have women involved. You know, for me, that goes completely against the grain of Republican values that you would adopt that attitude, you know. The 1934 IRA Army Convention happened near us here at St. Stephen's Green and it was to prove one of the most fractious conventions in the IRA's long and turbulent history. It was at this meeting that the IRA would endure yet another of the splits that have hampered that organisation throughout its history. Michael Price was the IRA's Director of Training who up till 1932 hadn't really been um, associated with the left in the IRA. He argues that the IRA should adopt a programme which puts the Workers' Republic as its ultimate aim and, and therefore not disband until the Workers' Republic is achieved, which essentially would have committed the IRA to socialism. That vote is lost and Price actually left the convention. Then Padre O'Donnell and George Gilmore had already talked about on several occasions the IRA becoming part of a broader movement to involve the trade unions, to involve socialist parties and communist groups, cultural groups in a broad front. And they put forward this motion that the IRA call for a Congress of Republican opinion. And that vote is only defeated by the votes of, of the IRA leadership. So it's very close and it shows the esteem in which a lot of the IRA's delegates held people like Gilmore and O'Donnell. They didn't always agree with them on everything, but they were very highly regarded within the IRA. So Donald Gilmore and Frank Ryan then also leave the IRA in the aftermath of losing this vote and they issue a public call for the Congress. So it becomes obvious then that the IRA has had a split about politics and then they group in with, with uh, Michael Price as well. Yeah, well I think you have to define what, what is the Republic? Yeah. And that was part of the problem in the aftermath of the Civil War. Mm. What were they fighting for? Just to be able to have another go at the Civil War, but this time to win it? Where did partition fit into their, 
their analysis. And as I said there, it was a question of going back to the men of no property, mm. uh, to the, the one social force which had been the backbone of the Civil War forces. In the end, I suppose, the departure of the left Republicans from within uh, the IRA leadership uh, was inevitable because Toomey and McBride and others were never going to fully endorse the strategy of O'Donnell and Gilmore. They were never going to take as assertive a stand against the inadequacies and failures of the Fianna Fáil government as it was then, uh, as uh, the left Republicans wanted. And while the technicalities of that departure were over their formal proposal uh, uh, to launch uh, a left Republican Congress, which the IRA would initiate, but would be a broad umbrella uh, for other progressive voices, uh, if it wasn't that, it would have been something else, in my view. The motion that Michael Price puts forward to the convention has the support of the majority of IRA rank and file members. They had narrowly voted in favour of it. In many ways, Price's motion was similar to the IRA's own Serrera policy. And it could be said what Price and others on the left were trying to do was get the IRA to recommit to its own social policy. Price's motion reaffirmed the IRA's allegiance to the Republic of Ireland, a republic in which the means of production and distribution should be held for use and not for profit. It stated that the republic would not exploit the labour of working class people. With such a hostility in Ireland, a growing hostility to communism, it's not surprising that the IRA leadership were fearful of this motion. And it was their votes that swung it against Price. After losing the vote, many proponents of the Ser era position left the hall, and thus, ultimately, they left the IRA. Some would be elected to the army executive, but they refused to take their seats in protest. Essentially, these men were now persona non grata to the army, and some would be court-martialed in their absence. For men like O'Donnell and Ryan, Gilmore and Price, there was now no option but to leave the IRA. If the IRA was not going to remain true to its stated social positions, they needed a new organisation, a new political body, to put forward these arguments. Those members of the IRA who withdrew after the Stevens Green Convention later met in Athlone, along with trade unionists, communists and other socially minded political activists. They believed that the republic they were going to fight for had to be a socialist republic. They believed that a capitalist republic could never truly be free. Britain would still rule it through her economic interests in the country. They wanted to appeal to the mass of the people on social and political issues, and they believed that was how they would differentiate themselves from Eamon de Valera's Fianna Fáil party. Essentially, they believed that they were following the tradition of Wolf Tone, James Connolly and Liam Mellows. If you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organisation of a socialist republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, her landlords, financiers, and through the whole array of commercial and industrial institutions she has planted in this country, and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. England would still rule you to your ruin, even while your lips offered hypocritical homage at the shrine of the freedom whose cause you betrayed. Two of the Connolly children, Nora and Roddy, were actively involved from the Republican Congress from the very beginning, and both attended the meeting in Athlone. Nora had been close to her father in the years before the 1916 Easter Rising. A member of Coming Amon in Belfast, she remained active in the Republican and left movements in the years that followed. She later recorded her memories of James in a wonderful book, Portrait of a Rebel Father. Roddy Connolly is in many ways a lesser known figure than his sister Nora, but he's equally important. A Moscow trained communist, he spent some time in the Soviet Union in the early 1920s, meeting Vladimir Lenin. He fought against the new Irish state, resisting the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and in the 1930s, he was still a constant voice of opposition to be found at street demonstrations. Roddy was one of those who argued for the re-establishment of an Irish citizen army. Now, it's important to state that physical force tradition is something held dear by many Irish Republicans, and political and military organisations have often gone hand in hand on a semi-secret level through Irish history. Patrick Byrne, a member of the Republican Congress, remembered that our experiences in the IRA weighed heavily on the new organisation for a period. If there was going to be an armed wing to the Republican Congress, it could only take one name, the Irish Citizen Army. The Irish Citizen Army had been established in 1913, over 20 years before the foundation of the Republican Congress. Among its founding members were Jim Larkin from Liverpool, James Connolly from Edinburgh and Captain Jack White DSO, a distinguished veteran of the British Army who had fought in the Boer War, 
before turning to radical politics. He was still active in radical politics decades later in the 1930s. Now there's a popular myth that the Irish Citizen Army ceased to exist at Easter 1916. That it and the Irish volunteers were moulded into a new organisation, the IRA, and with that they exited stage. In reality, however, the Citizen Army remained its own distinct organisation, fighting in the Civil War and retaining some structures in the years that followed. And when the Congress emerged in 1934, the Citizen Army had been calling for the Labour movement to take a vigorous stand against fascism and against the blue shirts. Congress emerged and the Citizen Army began to see that as potentially um, a movement they could be involved in. But for the Congress, the Citizen Army also performed a very um, important function because one of the criticisms the IRA made of O'Donnell and Gilmore was that they were abandoning armed force and for the IRA that meant essentially they were going, um, going constitutional. A lot of ex-IRA volunteers joined the Republican Congress and Congress realises that it's important to essentially keep them militarily active. So the Citizen Army in effect becomes in some ways the armed wing of Congress and it goes from being a small number of 1916 veterans in Dublin to several hundred people organised across the country during 1934, mostly ex-IRA members who are joining the Republican Congress. ICA members are amongst the broad left who had met in that loan in early 1934. Athlone was chosen for the meeting because of its symbolic placement at the very heart of Ireland and about 200 people in total attended the meeting. And there were mainly former members of the IRA but there were also trade unionists and socialists among them and one member of the Communist Party of Ireland, Paddy Gralton. Paddy was the brother of Jimmy Gralton who has the honour of being the only Irishman ever deported from this state. Jimmy Gralton's crimes had included running a dance hall in defiance of church authorities and significant land agitation in the west of Ireland. But the document itself, the Athlone Manifesto, is very, very similar actually to the IRA's um, governmental programme from 1933. Um, many of the same aims, same policies and same, same outlook, uh, nationalisation of, of transport, of banking, um, uh, promotion of the Gaelic language, development of fisheries, all these kind of really practical ideas um, to move towards a more kind of left-leaning republic. The meeting produced what became known as the Athlone Manifesto, the aims and objectives of the Republican Congress. And in many ways, the manifesto was similar to the Serra era policy of the IRA in the early 1930s. It was certainly socialistic in outlook, but on private property and other issues, it did make some capitulations. The Serra era really has more communistic language within it. Um, if, you, if you look at that in a little bit more detail and look at the language that's used, uh, you can see elements of the um, Comintern's third period uh, phraseology of um, class against class, so the communists were the true, the true revolutionaries and this, this kind of language comes out. And Pat O'Donnell was really influenced by that at the time in 1931 and that comes through in the, the language of, of, of Sierra Era. Um, so the ethos of, of all these documents is very similar. In many ways, the Athlone Manifesto was similar to the IRA's own Ser Era document, which they had only abandoned in the face of church and establishment opposition. The new manifesto had the support of many rank-and-file IRA members, and crucially, it was also supported by Cumann Amon, the Women's Auxiliary, who had an office here on Pierce Street. Many members of Cumann Amon, including Sheila Humphreys, would be vitally important to the new organisation, building for the Republican Congress meeting at Mines. Sadly, the women of Cumann Amon would soon abandon the Republican Congress, believing it to be too hostile to the army, the IRA. When the Republican Congress comes along, um, they, they are the now outer edge, Cumann Amon, Mary McSweeney, everybody is left. Um, there's, I think they've got about two people left who were involved in 1916. And they're involved, um, invited to get involved in the Republican Congress, and they accept, and they go along and um, they're flirting with the idea of socialism, but they're still wedded to the idea of the Pope. They are religious conservatives. Um, they don't really know what they're doing. Um, there was no great brain there. There never was, but there's no great brain there um, in, in the terms of political brain. So they become involved with this because the IRA become involved. And then there's the split in the IRA over the Congress and they go with the conservative forces and they step away. The leadership of the IRA were unhappy with an organisation like the Republican Congress existing. They recognised that this new group could challenge the traditional hegemony of the militant Republican tradition and that those who traditionally would be drawn towards the IRA could be pulled instead towards this new organisation. 
What emerged was a war of words and jeering, played out in the pages of both organisations' newspapers. Yet while the IRA was unhappy with the split, they did not resort to violence. Why? Well, one factor may have been the respect towards people like Pater O'Donnell and Frank Ryan, who they recognised had major influence over some of those who had left the organisation. While the guns stayed at home, there were to be scenes of violence. The following year, at Bowdoin Sound, there would be physical clashes between members of the IRA and Congress supporters from the north of Ireland, who had travelled to commemorate Wolf Tone. 